This is the story of a problem not yet solved. The story of an attempt to do justice to the prospects New Zealand should hold out for the future of her citizens. An attempt by a young nation to make gardens and build homes as fast as its citizens can fill in forms, as fast as an eager people can reach out for the space that belongs to them and the future of New Zealand. An attempt by New Zealand to bend to the use of the people their raw material for health. The fresh air that is so plentiful, not in bed sitting rooms, but over the free surface of New Zealand's open spaces. And so shamefully scarce in the cramped city streets. Not that the attempt has been a failure in itself. In contrast to this, 12,000 housewives today work in modern kitchens. To replace the patterned house of poverty, the state housing scheme has built nearly 12,000 new homes. To fit the sometimes awkward shapes of the New Zealand landscape, expert architects have designed a host of model houses open to sun and air, each with its character, standardized in detail for economy, but each one planned separately so that owners can say with pride, this is my home. The vast work of supplying joinery to almost 15,000 houses for which contracts have been let has been the work of a factory established especially to make, for example, door sashes and window frames. To concentrate all the available resources on a job of vital importance, an army of contractors assembled all these components. And the sections were no sooner surveyed and subdivided and the men put to work. Then houses sprang up everywhere beside wide streets ready to correct a shortage which began when the First World War diverted men and materials from this important part of the job of nation building. Between 1914 and 1918, housing construction received its first important setback in New Zealand. The position was aggravated when building dwindled again during the depression of the 30s and the planned scheme of new construction became essential. But the work of the State Housing Department, reinforced by private building and sales, is overtaken by war. Caught in the vortex, New Zealand must turn from self-improvement to self-preservation. Workmen turn aside to the sound of voices more insistent, more menacing. Democracy's cost of living must be paid in a new currency. Over the sounds of men at work come louder noises defying democracy to answer the challenge of extinction threatened. Into the lives of these women and children playing in the sunshine comes the shadow of a monster caring not whether husbands stay at home or go to war. Across every avenue of national life cuts the barrier of total war. But democracy must look to what comes after. For a free people, wars are not ends in themselves. 21,000 people have reason to apply for state rental houses. Only 3,000 houses are immediately available. So the work must be continued. Hitler may grab for the wealth of Asia while his early conquests lie exhausted by his greed. In New Zealand, there is still the sanity of people having tea and cakes with children playing round them. Eyes unspoiled by sight of horrors ears not yet deafened by the sound of bombs. As New Zealand gathers herself for one great effort, the housing department punches stubbornly along at the other. A home is built to last. Men and machines of war cause nothing but their own destruction in the end. In the background, New Zealand retains her vision for the future. Here, with what tools and workmen's hands the world may leave her, she builds while she can. To save herself, she makes the machines of war. But in their use, she remembers that humanity's destiny has greater ends than death. <laughs> 